We have the capacity to change our nervous system and thereby choose to become a new kind of chooser in the future. There are many ways that our nervous system changes in response to what we do and what we think. We've already considered some, including meditation and other practices. There are many other feedback mechanisms whereby usage of a neural circuit changes its physical structure and thereby its function. In this section, we'll review some of the most basic ones and how they might operate at the level of neural circuits. One of the most common ways that we can transform our brains and minds simply by willing it to be so is that we can choose to learn something. Such learning is tied up with the slogan from Donald Hebb that neurons that fire together wire together. The idea is that when the firing of a presynaptic neuron immediately precedes the firing of a postsynaptic neuron, the synapse linking those two neurons will strengthen. It can strengthen in various ways. It can express more receptors, such as AMPA or NMDA receptors. It can involve greater neurotransmitter release, and in many cases, new dendritic spines can grow. Long-term potentiation, or LTP, is NMDA receptor dependent. Because the calcium that enters a neuron after NMDA receptors have opened triggers a whole cascade of events inside the cell, including protein synthesis that then goes into strengthening synapses in a process that takes hours, not milliseconds. LTP is especially strong following the high-frequency arrival of spikes as occurs in bursting that is most likely to trigger NMDA receptor opening. In contrast, when a presynaptic spike is not predictive of the timing of spiking of a postsynaptic neuron, the synapses linking these neurons tend to weaken in a process known as long-term depression. If it is correct that attention enhances burst transmission along epicircuits, then LTP may not just strengthen local synaptic connectivities between neuron pairs, it may strengthen whole epicircuits just as many people walking over the grass can wear down new paths in it. For example, the bucket brigade of information processing set up by attending may become more efficient as short-term and temporal synaptic weight changes, such as the opening of NMDA receptors, get hardwired into long-term synaptic weight changes realized in structural reconfirmation of synapses. In this way, paying attention volitionally can alter neural wiring at the level of neurons and neural circuits. If we choose to learn something, we will, by practicing, make certain neurons fire together and thereby wire together. Another way that volitional practice can get hardwired into the nervous system is via enhanced myelinization. Recall that myelin functions a bit like the insulation around a cable, enhancing its ability to transmit information without signal loss. In the central nervous system, there is a kind of glial cell called an oligodendrocyte that wraps its arms around surrounding axons, as shown here, forming the myelin around axons. There is a feedback process such that the more action potentials go down a neighboring axon, the more oligodendrocytes will tend to wrap around it. This is a bit like muscles getting bigger the more you use them. In one study, my group compared Dartmouth students who learned Chinese in an intensive language course with a control group of students who did not learn a foreign language. Using a technique called diffusion tensor imaging, we were able to localize axons that had become more organized, probably because of increased myelination. The parts of the brain that are colored yellow and red here indicate axonal tracts that became more organized in the test group, presumably because they learned the foreign language. If we choose to learn something, say Chinese, we will, by practicing, make axonal paths involved in that processing become more efficient by virtue of stronger myelination. Experience, moreover, itself alters cortical organization throughout life. Plasticity in rat cortex is increased when the rats spend even a few days in an enriched environment. For example, Marion Diamond showed that cortical thickness differs in rats raised in an impoverished, standard, or enriched cage environment during their second month of life. The enriched group had a cage with extensive opportunities for social interaction and exploration of new objects. The standard group had fewer such opportunities, and the impoverished group had none. The enriched group had a significant cortical thickening relative to the standard group, while the impoverished group exhibited relative cortical thinning. There appear to be multiple factors that lead to increased cortical thickness. Neurons in rats with enriched experience showed increased number, cell body size, 
nuclear size, dendritic arborization and length, and the number of dendritic spines, synapses, and NMDA receptors. Increased neural growth factor release likely plays a role in this as enriched brains exhibited increased levels of nerve growth factor mRNA. Such plasticity may be related to voluntary attention in particular, in that acetylcholine may be released from cholinergic basal forebrain nucleus neurons onto targeted cortical circuitry corresponding to the attended locus of information processing. This is thought to be a mechanism that realizes both increased alertness, enhanced neural processing of relevant inputs, and enhanced learning through increased neural plasticity. This figure by Diamond shows what can happen to a mature pyramidal cell depending on environment and experience. The path from A to C shows increased arborization with environmental enrichment, whereas the path from A to F shows increased atrophy with environmental impoverishment. It seems that experience, behavior, social interaction, stress, and other factors such as exercise, environmental quality, and nutrition influence brain chemistry and organization at the synaptic and dendritic level. We can harness this feedback process by taking charge of the environment in which our brains will operate in the future. We can populate our world with friends who will enrich our minds and social interactions and minimize contact with those who impoverish our life and social interactions. We can enhance our chances for exploration and novelty and minimize boredom and drudgery. Changing our environment to foster future enrichment can enrich our neurons, so to speak, because of neural growth factors that are released when we have positive social interactions, when we pay attention, and when we exercise and explore. If you want to change your brain, then change your environment to enrich it. Plasticity realized in such mechanisms could play a more prominent role in adult learning as modifications are made to existing processing structures. Thus, at a minimum, the brain is analogous to our muscles. If we work out particular mental muscles, the neural substrate of those processes will get stronger. But the brain is more flexible than this. With practice, we can learn whole new classes of things, whether a new instrument, a new language, or hang gliding. We don't just strengthen existing muscles, we can effectively grow new mental muscles with effort and practice. For example, if we learn a new domain of expertise, whether the piano or hang gliding, we have increased the domains of our free choice. We could say that by cultivating new representational spaces and deepening existing ones, we increase the magnitude of our free will. Another way that learning alters our brains and minds is via chunking and automatization. Experience plays a central role in chunking of simpler representations and operations, which can in turn facilitate future volitional processes by allowing them to operate on these more complex operands. One possibility is that attention plays a role in converting criteria expressed at the level of working memory to a format expressed at the level of criterial decoders realized in dedicated neurons or groups of neurons. For example, it may take some attentional effort to convert a novel sight-read piano chord to a hand position, but with practice, this becomes chunked and automatized, such that one hardwires both the recognition of this novel pattern of notes and the motoric commands that realize a hand position without the need for attention. Consciousness, therefore, may not only exist so that relatively high-level representations in the form of qualia can be endogenously attended and otherwise operated upon, it may exist so that attention can chunk automatize and hardwire recognition of feature patterns and execute action patterns, automatizing these in order to make processing faster and potentially unconscious. Like a good teacher, attention might have the goal of making itself superfluous. If endogenous attention is thought of as the binding of representations in working memory, or as Anne Treisman put it, a feature glue, it is a glue that can harden making future binding unnecessary. Attention might then be thought to operate in order to make itself unnecessary. To the extent that consciousness is the domain of present actual and potential future endogenous attentional bindings, one might say that one reason that we have consciousness is to make as much processing unconscious as possible. Endogenous attentional manipulation, while flexible, because any representation can be glued with any other, is slow and inefficient. Pre-glued or pre-compiled representations and motor sequences, while inflexible, are processed efficiently and rapidly. The structure of experience or consciousness will therefore change as we create more and more neo-primitive features. That is, as we master domains, we will process the world in terms of chunks and meta-chunks. 
whether perceptually, cognitively, or motorically. One very potent form of chunking that we can volitionally harness is habit formation. Basically, there are two modes of responding to inputs. One is slow, volitional, and flexible, which involves the conscious weighing of options. And the other is fast, automatized, inflexible, and largely unconscious, and is associated with habit formation. The conscious volitional system is realized in the cortical executive circuitry that we have considered so far, especially the frontal parietal control network. The habit formation system especially involves chunking action patterns, whether motoric, emotional, or cognitive, in sequences that are implemented as automatized units without the need for conscious deliberation. Central to this chunking process are the basal ganglia, shown here, and especially the dorsal areas, also known as the dorsal striatum, called the caudate nucleus and the putamen. The caudate nucleus, shown here, is the key structure in habit formation. This chunking is fostered or guided by reward signals realized in dopaminergic inputs from a midbrain structure, shown here, called the substantia nigra, in particular from that subnucleus called the substantia nigra pars compacta. We can volitionally harness our brain's propensity to form habits or automatized action chunks by consciously fostering the wiring up of later unconscious good habits. We can make sure to reward ourselves for behaviors that we want to make habitual. For example, let's say we want to make exercise a habit. Rather than think about it endlessly and hate ourselves for not starting, we can set things up in our lives so that we will go to the gym. We can buy a gym pass, set up a regular schedule with a gym partner who won't let us slack off. We can start small, say with 15 minutes a day, rather than start off with a marathon. We can build it into our schedule, consciously at first, until it becomes an automatized good habit. Exercising will naturally give us reward signals, and then we will get hooked or addicted in a good way. Knowing the power of operant conditioning or reward in shaping our behavior, and knowing that habit formation is natural, we can effectively shape ourselves towards certain automaticities of mind that we will to set in motion. At first, this might take conscious effort, but eventually we'll become so automatized as to become part and parcel of our very character.